page 481. And all we're going to do is, is finish this today. We won't get into um, Flannery O'Connor. 481, we saw, or very briefly mentioned um, before we finish, you know, they, they leave the general store and Sardi hears one of the boys kind of whisper, barn burner, and gets in a fight with him, okay? Kind of gets beat up. And they go down to the wagon, and the mother sees him. She says he's hurt, and he says, don't worry about this, you know. Um, and while they're traveling along, you know, the mother asks, you know, does it hurt, page 482 and such. And he says, don't worry, I'll wash it tonight. And we're told, paragraph 25, the wagon goes on. He, Sardi, did not know where they were going. None of them ever did or asked. It was always somewhere, always a house of sorts, a day or two days, or maybe three days away. Likely his father had already arranged to make a crop on another farm before he dot, dot, dot. What's the dot, dot, dot mean? Yeah, before he burned the barn down. Okay. And again, he had to stop himself. Why? He, he can't put it into words. He can't say what he knows his father is. Again, he had to stop himself. He, the father, always did. That is, he always had something planned. There was something, and we get this long sentence, that describes Abner Snopes. There was something about his wolf-like independence and even courage when the advantage was at least neutral, which impressed strangers, as if they got from his latent, ravening ferocity not so much a sense of dependability as a feeling that his ferocious conviction in the rightness of his own actions would be of advantage to all whose interests lay with his, or interest. Okay? Let's go back at, that look back at that sentence again and take it apart a little bit. Something about his wolf-like independence. Are wolves independent creatures? No, they're not. Wolves are pack animals. What? So why do we have the phrase a lone wolf? You'll hear, you know, there will be a terrorist event. And the question immediately becomes, well, was it a lone wolf? Or was it part of a cell? Okay. So what's a, what's a lone wolf? What's a wolf without its pack? Why is a wolf not in a pack? Louder? Okay. The pack has kicked it out. So when you have a lone wolf, that's when you know that person goes against everything that the pack or human society supports. So if somebody is a lone wolf, that means they no longer fit with the people they should fit with. So that's the first little thing. Something about his wolf-like independence and even courage. What? When the advantage was at least neutral, which impressed strangers. Advantage was at least neutral. Whose advantage? Doesn't matter because it's neutral. That is, nobody has the advantage. That impresses strangers. What? Abner's wolf-like independence. Strangers see Abner and they're like, man, look at this guy. He fights for himself. He stands up for himself. Even when it's him against everybody else. Okay? As if they, the strangers, got from his, notice, latent, ravening ferocity. Latent. It's just hidden under the surface. You know, you've, you've heard the phrase to talk about certain people. They've got a short fuse. What does that mean? The slightest little thing will set them off, make them blow. Okay? So that's the latent part. Ravening. What does it mean if you're ravenous? Really hungry. But it's not food that he's ravening for. It's ferocity. This is the kind of person gets in a fight and doesn't stop till what? The other person's dead, right? Okay? 
as if they got from his late revenant ferocity, not so much a sense of dependability, that is, he'll be there, he'll be by our side, so to speak, as a feeling that his ferocious conviction in what? <clears throat> the rightness of his own actions. Ferocious conviction in the rightness of his own actions. Well, we do kind of, you know, appreciate and look up to people who stick to their guns, who stick to their convictions. What's the problem with the description? What if you are proven to be wrong and you still stick to the conviction of your actions? What if your actions are universally acknowledged wrong and you still stick to them? Does that then become something to be praised, something to be emulated, something to be admired? No. But it's as if his ferocious conviction in the rightness of his own actions would be what? Of advantage to all those whose interest lay with his. In other words, as long as he's got those convictions and he's fighting on my side, okay, let him do whatever to our enemies. That's an interesting little paragraph, does it, or sentence, because it tells us a lot about Abner. It tells us he doesn't back down from a fight. It tells us he always thinks he's right. And it tells us, you know, that when he, like a terrier, he gets hold of a rabbit, that sucker's not getting away. So they go off. They camp that night in a grove of oaks. They have a fire. They don't have a big fire. They have a little fire. And we get a description about why he doesn't build big fires. We're also told what he did during the Civil War. That the niggard blaze was the living fruit of nights passed during those four years in the woods, hiding from all men, blue or gray, with his strings of horses, captured horses, he called them. What did he do during the Civil War? He was a horse thief. Horse thief was one of the worst things you could be in the 1860s. Right? Notice, he didn't fight for blue or gray. And we're told, you know, the boy, older still, would think other thoughts. So they camp. The father takes the boy off and says, you were fixing to tell them. You would have told them. Told them what? The truth. Yet, my daddy burned the barn down. The him is the justice of the peace, the court. Okay. The them is the court. The him is the justice of the peace. And notice the boy doesn't answer. And so what does the father do? Smacks him. Hard, but without heat. Without heat means without passion. Without feeling. Yeah, he hits him hard. But he's not pissed. Okay? You're getting to be a man. You got to learn. You got to learn to stick to your own blood. Or he ain't going to have any blood to stick to you. What, does, what are we told about the boy's thought processes in that opening paragraph? He's sitting there in the back. He sees those cans of food. He's hungry because his stomach reads them, sees the images of the fish and such. Okay. And we're told about the old fierce pull of blood. Okay. Here, what's Abner saying? You got to learn, stick to your own blood, or you ain't going to have any blood stick to you. Blood is family. If you don't stick with your family, he's saying, then what? Nobody will stick with you. Okay? You think either of them, any man there this morning would, would stick with you, would have supported you? Don't you know all they wanted was a chance to get at me because they knew I had them beat? How did he have them beat? They didn't have concrete evidence. And yet, who had to move? 
Well, was it Mr. Harris? It was the Snubs family that had to move. Okay. 20 years later, the boy would tell himself. So the narrator jumps forward 20 years. If I had said they wanted only truth, justice, he would have hit me again. Now, go back a page for a moment. Two pages. Bottom of 480. Sardi walks up, and as he's walking, he looks at that justice of peace, and he thinks, enemy, enemy. And we're told he could not see the justice of the peace's face. He could not see that the justice's face was kindly, nor discern that his voice was troubled when he spoke to the man named Harris. That is, the justice of the peace does not want to put this 10-year-old boy on the witness stand and compel him to testify against his father. Which shows us what about the justice of the peace? Is he just out to get Abner, like Abner thinks? No. No. This is showing he's merciful. This is showing care for the boy. Okay? Again, if you don't stick to blood, you won't have anybody to stick with you. It seems to imply that the justice of the peace would have stuck with him. Okay? So they go on to the next house. How many times have they moved in Abner's, excuse me, in Sardi's 10 years? 12. They've moved 12 times. He's only 10 years old. His brother and sisters are all older, older than he is. We don't know how many times they moved before that. Okay? So, Abner calls Sardi and says, come with me. The missus goes, Abner? I reckon I'll have a word with a man that aims to begin tomorrow, owning me body and soul for the next eight months. What does he do for a living? How, how, this is post-Civil War. Slavery's done. How can somebody own him, body and soul, for eight months? Sharecropping. They're sharecropping. So, imagine this room is the field he is sharecropping. He's got to produce X number of bushels of, let's say, corn from this field. What he can produce over that that's what he gets to keep. Okay? That's one way of doing it. Or it could be he gets this little bit to produce for himself. Out of all of that other spot, he's got to produce 100 bushels of corn. This, whatever amount he produces, that's what he keeps. Okay? So, they go up the road, they come across a grove of oaks and cedars, flowering trees, shrubs, shrubs, but he can't see the house yet. Normally, that's when he sees the house. They keep going, and we're told, now beyond a sweep of drive, this is the bottom of 483, he saw the house for the first time, and at that instant, he forgot his father, and the terror and despair both. What terror, what despair? First paragraph. The smell and sense just a little of fear because mostly of despair and grief, the old fierce pool of blood. The despair, the grief, the fear might be of a 10 year old looking at his father and saying, please God, don't let me be like him. So they go up, they reach the walkway, the path, and you have an example of this on page 479. Faulkner's home, called Rowan Oak, Tupelo, uh, Oxford, Mississippi. Okay. It was run down by the time Faulkner got it, and he renovated it. Now it's a um, National Register of Historic Places house. 
So this is the kind of house. They come into this walkway lined by trees. See this big old house down at the end with columns and everything. Sardi has noticed, we're told, has never seen a house like this before. One this big. Why? Because up until now, they'd only moved in poor country. And we get, the narrator takes us inside Sardi's mind. It's big as a courthouse. He thought quietly, with a surge of peace and joy, whose reason he could not have put into words. That is, the reason for the peace and joy, he couldn't have put into words. But he sees this big house, and it's like all the tension, all the anger, all the despair and fear flows away from him. And he thinks, people whose lives are a part of this peace and dignity are beyond his time. He no more to them than a buzzing wasp. So in thinking of the people that live in a house like this compared to his father, his father is reduced to what? A bug. A stinging bug. Notice, not a fly, not an ant, a buzzing wasp. If you've ever been stung by a wasp, you know you don't want to get stung by a wasp but capable of stinging for a little moment, but that's all. The spell of this peace and dignity rendering even the barns and stable and cribs which belong to it impervious to the puny flames he might contrive. This spell, it's like this place is protected by peace and dignity. Why? Because it's so big. So, he kind of comes back to himself and he notices his father is still walked on. So here's, here's Sardi. His father's walked on. And what does his father do to Sardi's perspective of the house? He kind of dwarfs the house. Why? Sardi's shorter. His father's standing in front of him. The house is farther back. His father's blocking the perspective. And we're told... The peace and joy ebbing for an instant as he looked again at the stiff black back. We're going to be told repeatedly that Abner is described with the adjective stiff. Okay? The stiff and implacable limp of the figure which was not dwarfed by the house. What does implacable mean? Cannot be placated. Placate means to appease, to resolve, to bring peace to. Okay? His limp is implacable. That is, it's always there. You can't stop it. Okay? So he's walking on. And what does he do? He steps into a pile of fresh dung. Horse manure. And notice we're told... He could have missed that pile of horse manure. He could have adjusted his stride. What else could he have done? Could have turned off to the side a little bit, but nope. He steps right in it with that bad leg of his. And the boy thinks, top of 484. This feeling, these feelings of peace and joy ebbed only for a moment, though he could have could not have thought this into words either. Walking on in the spell of the house, which he could even want, but without envy, without sorrow. Certainly never with that ravening and jealous rage, which unknown to him, walked in the iron-like black coat before him. Again, ravening, but now also jealous. Rage. Abner's what? If we were to update Abner to today, how would he be described? Probably one of the two path words. A sociopath or a psychopath. You know, they would use the phrase going postal to describe him. It doesn't take much to set him off. And the boy thinks maybe he will feel it too. That is the peace, the serenity, the joy. Maybe it will even change him now from what maybe he couldn't help but be. They cross the portico. What's the portico? Porch. 
right? Knocks on the door, servant opens, tells him to wipe his feet. Why? Because he sees manure sticking out from underneath the sole of Abner's bad foot. What did Abner do? He steps on the threshold, leaves a little bit there, and then walks maybe a couple steps forward and steps onto this nice pale rug, which we're told the pale rug comes all the way from France. Okay. Miss Lula, Major Spain's wife, comes down. She asks him to go away. Major Spain is not home. And notice, he's standing in the middle of the rug. What could he do? He could pick up his foot, turn around, and walk out. But no. He pivots on his good foot, that is the good foot stays fixed, and he does this. Drags the bad foot around. Creates a semicircle of horse dung. Now rubbed into this pale rug that has come all the way from France. They leave. They walk back down the walkway. They turn around. And Abner draws Sardi's attention back to the house. Pretty and white, ain't it? That's sweat. Nigger sweat. Maybe it ain't white enough yet to suit him. Maybe he wants to make some white sweat with it. Two hours later, boys chopping wood behind their little house. And in comes a linen-clad man on a fine sorrel mare. A Negro youth following on a fat bay carriage horse. And on the back of the horse, the rug. So they have to clean the rug because the rug's been stained. Notice, Abner's wife wants to do it. He says, no, I'll do it. How does he go about fixing the rug? But two things does he use. Lye, lye soap, which is an acid, and a field stone. Keep in mind, this is before washers and dryers. They might have a washboard, you know, about this long with um, corrugated metal on it that you rub the clothes against, soapy clothes, to get dirt and stuff out, and then you rinse them and hang them. They might have one of those, but that would be pretty hard to use on a rug. So he gets a field stone. He goes out in the field. He picks up a rock, and he scrapes that against the rug. Gets the stain out, but also ruins the rug. Okay? Takes it back up to the big house. And the next day, page 486 at the bottom, about paragraph 63, I guess. Major Spain says, you must realize you have ruined that rug. Wasn't there anybody here, any of your women? It cost $100. But you never had $100. You never will have $100. So I'm going to charge you 20 bushels of corn against your crop. That is, against the crop you would have raised for yourself. Now you've got to give me 20 bushels of corn out of that to pay for the damage to the rug. Because he's going to get the rug repaired? No. It's just to pay for it. Okay? We're going to be told later on that corn is going to be sold probably in the fall at 50 cents a bushel. So 20 bushels of corn at 50 cents a bushel. Is that right? 20 cents? Yeah. So the boy says, no, we ain't going to do it, et cetera. They go back into town the next day, or a day or two later, and we're told, middle of 487, the boy thinks, paragraph 70, maybe this is the end of it. Maybe even that 20 bushels that seems hard to have to pay for just a rug will be a cheap price for him to stop forever. 
and always from being what he used to be. Maybe he won't even collect the 20 bushels. Maybe, maybe, maybe. They go into town and we hear the justice say, when the boy cries out, he ain't done it, he ain't burnt. Go back to the way. Burnt? Do I understand this rug was burned too? Now, the two makes me think maybe this is the same justice of the peace that was in the previous one. But in the previous one, previous, the barn burning, the justice of the peace said, leave this country. He didn't mean the United States. He meant this area. You would think maybe it would be a different justice, but might, maybe not. His father, anybody here claim it was? So, justice of the peace. So you, the you here is Abner. You claim 20 bushels of corn is too high for the damage you did to the rug. What is Abner's defense? He brought me a rug. He told me to clean it. I cleaned it. No stain on the rug. Not anymore. I washed out the track, took the rug back to him. But you didn't carry the rug back to him in the same condition it was in before you made the tracks in it. Now, what could Abner say? If Abner were really good, if he were a lawyer in training, or he hired a really good lawyer, what would the lawyer say? Yeah, but that was never part of the deal. That's not what he said to do. But notice Abner's silent. Why? He can't think that far ahead. So, here's where the justice issues his sentence. I'm going to find against you, Mr. Snopes. I'm going to find that you were responsible for the injury of the Major Spain's rug. Hold you liable for it. 20 bushels of corn seems a little high for a man in your circumstances. Major to Spain say, claims it cost $100. All right? $100. October corn will be worth about 50 cents. That's 50 cents a bushel. I figure Major to Spain can stand a $95 loss on something he paid cash for. You can stand a $5 loss you haven't earned yet. So, you got to come up with 10 bushels of corn for Major to Spain. Now think about just the trial scene. Abner comes out of this how? Compared to how he was when he walked in. He kind of won, right? Because when he walked in, he was being charged 20 bushels of corn. He's just had that sentence cut in half. What about Major Spain? He's got a $100 rug that is what to him now? Destroyed. Destroyed. He has a $95 loss. He gets screwed out of this deal. Okay. So they leave. They pick up some oil while they're there. They go on home. And that evening, page 489, we hear the mother's voice. Abner, no, no, oh God, oh God, Abner. Paragraph 85. And the father's there. And he empties the reservoir of the lamp back into the five-gallon kerosene can from which it had been filled. Shifts the lamp to the other hand. Throws his wife back, not savagely, not viciously, just hard, into the wall. He tells the older brother, go get the other can. Or, excuse me, he tells Abner, he tells Sardi, go get the other can. What? What are you? What are you? He doesn't finish the sentence. Go get that oil. But the boy's running. He runs to the barn. And as he runs, what does he think? A little bit of foreshadowing here. I could keep on running. I could not stop at the barn. I could run on and on and never look back, never need to see his face, his face again. Only that point. Why can't he? Because of that old fierce pull of blood. What is really being pulled? in sardine. 
Look at this. Individual versus blood. Sardi versus family. But what else? Individual versus society. But is this Sardi or is this Abner versus society? How about right versus wrong? Where is the right? What is the wrong? His father's definitely in the wrong, right? I think, I, I would hope everybody in this room would go, yeah, burn and burns because you don't get your way is not the way to, you know. Legal versus illegal, moral versus immoral. All of these things are being, are intention in Sardi, right? Because he's 10 years old. He's still trying to figure out what is right and wrong, okay? So, he has the can now, notice, because he's thought, only I can't, I can't. And he's running back to the house and gives the can to his father. Notice the tension. Aren't you going to even send a nigger? What has he done in the past? We know in the previous barn burning, he did send a warning. Aren't you even going to? He's not going to now. What did that warning allow Mr. Harris to be able to do? He got his stock out of this. So he didn't lose his animals. He didn't lose his livestock. He lost his barn. Okay? This time, the implication is what could happen. It could be not only livestock. This time the father doesn't strike him. What does he do? He grabs him and holds on to him. Tells the older brother, empty the can into the other can. Go on, I'll catch up with you. And he tells his wife, hold him. 490. Lenny, take hold of him. I want to see you do it. If he gets loose, don't you know what he's going to do? He'll go up yonder. That is, if he gets loose... And he goes up yonder. What will Sardi do? Tell. He'll warn them. And what will happen as a result of that? I'll get caught. You want that to happen, Lenny? I don't know about you, but most women I know would probably go, yep. Because <laughs> this is a, definitely an abusive relationship. I'll hold him. See you do. He starts struggling. Let me go. Let me go. And the aunt says, let him go. If you don't, by God, I'll go up there myself. So the boy's running, finds to Spain, and says, barn. What? Barn. Barn? Yes, barn. <laughs> Notice he doesn't say anything else. Burn, father, matches, So Sardi starts running back down the road. And Major Despain comes behind him and his horse goes off past him. And we're told, 491. The tranquil early summer night sky, which even before the shape of the horse and rider vanished, strained abruptly and violently upward. How so? A long swirling roar, incredible and soundless, blotting the stars. And he, springing up into the road again, running again, knowing it was too late, yet still running, even after he heard the shot, and an instant later, two shots. What was the long, swirling roar, incredible and soundless? Notice, it's not a roar he hears with his ears. Is it he passes out, he falls over, and he hears... What are we meant to infer from the three shots? Daddy's dead. Probably his brother's dead too. Pat, pat, he keeps running. Looking backward over his shoulder at the glare as he got up. What glare? The barn's burning. Is it just the barn? We don't know. Okay. 
But he eventually runs so long at midnight. He was sitting on the crest of a hill. He did not know it was midnight. He did not know how far he'd come. But there's no glare anymore. Now, I don't know if you've ever been out on relatively flat terrain. Maybe there's a hill or two. And seeing a bonfire in the distance or some kind of fire in the distance. But if you have, you know. You can see those fires for a long distance at nighttime. That glare will carry 20 or 30 miles. He's run so far, he no longer sees the glare. That's either, excuse me, he's run and he no longer sees the glare. That's either because he's run so far, he's outrun the distance of the light, or the fire's been put out. I think the text kind of implies it's the former. He has run so far. Okay. His back toward what he had called home for days, his face towards the dark woods. That's symbolism. His back is towards what? The old fierce pull of blood. He broke the link. And he cries to himself, hugging himself into the remainder of his thin rotten shirt, the grief and despair now no longer terror and fear. No longer terror and fear of what? His father. But now just grief and despair. Why grief and despair? Because he's all alone. He's 10 years old. And he thinks, my father, my father, he was a hero. He was in the war. He was in Colonel, he doesn't realize his father wasn't in Colonel Sartor's cavalry. Okay. And that he was there for one reason alone, to steal. And we get this long paragraph at the bottom. The constellations wheel on, the birds sing, the sun rises, and we're told he got up. He was a little stiff, but walking would cure that too, as it would the cold, and soon there would be the sun. He went on down the hill toward the dark woods, which the liquid silver voices of the birds called unceasing, the rapid and urgent beating of the urgent inquiring heart of a late spring night. He did not look back. Why? Done. Done. He's not going to go back to his mother. He's not going to go back to his sisters. Why? It's kind of like the family's cursed. I don't mean that literally. He's making a break from all of that. Right? He's going to start a new day. He's going to start a new day. He's going to be an individual rather than a Snopes, so to speak. Okay. All right, we'll stop there. Um, for Friday... Uh, read the little introduction to Flannery O'Connor. Read A Good Man is Hard to Find. And I think I've got um, on the syllabus selections from a couple, short selections from a couple of letters that are also in the, um, in the textbook. I don't know that we will have a separate exam over the short fiction.